Thank you for that, Ilan. That was graphic, as you said, and necessary, I think, to, to understand what it's like. How's the sound? Good. I'll, um, I don't know if I can channel all of you, but um, since we can't take your questions, uh, I, I'd like to, to start. The, what you ended with really reminds me of some of the cases we've seen in the US, um, charging material support for terrorism. And Palestinians are often the victims in these cases. Um, and the collaboration with Israel on these kinds of prosecutions is phenomenal. Um, and you see Shin Bet agents come and testify, and they're allowed to testify anonymously in disguise. And there are secret files. <laughs> and you can't mention the occupation, and you can't mention um, 1948. And um, I'm. It's, it's really, uh, it, not to mention the kind of mass incarceration system here in the US that targets communities of color in particular. Do you, do you think about those kinds of uh, uh, connections? And, oh, and, yes. and ha have you seen that kind of collaboration uh, between the US and, and Israel in the, in the legal sense? Yes, and not uh, only with the United States, also with Europe. Since uh, the so-called war on terror started, uh, uh, kind of enhanced by a new wave of Islamophobia, uh, Israel uh, exports securitization, uh, not only to the United States, but also to European countries. And it offers a model of how to deal with individual cases of terrorism based on its model of incarceration, oppression, uh, and brutalization in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And uh, it's, it's a very worrying uh, development because uh, Israel is still accepted by the people who manage security in this country and manage homeland security in other Western countries they still accept Israel as a kind of uh, the expert state on these issues. And there is a great danger that these methods would be exported from Israel into the rest of the West. I remember when the Israeli Minister of Transport, uh, Katz, uh, um, visited Belgium after one of these attacks in Brussels. He said on, Israeli, uh, on the Belgian television, uh, you know, he said to the audience, you have only few terrorists and you don't know how to deal with them. We have millions of terrorists and we know how to deal with them. We can help you. And this was done in a brusque and simplistic way, but this is the way Israel exports itself. And this is the way since we created this idea that there is a war on terror, uh, especially against Islam, that they can present themselves as the experts. So I do see the actual uh, collaboration happening here and in Brazil, for instance, uh, in other places. Uh, and I also see something very worrying, if I may add. The Israeli military industry and security industry is using the Gaza Strip as a laboratory in order to show in real life how the new weapons work. They intentionally use the tension on the Gaza border in order to experiment with new weapons of destruction that then are, can be demonstrated as effective to governments all over the world that want to use excessive force in order to oppress legitimate uh, uh, uprisings and demonstrations and resistance movements. And they don't hide it. <laughs> no, they don't hide it at all. They're very proud of it. They market these things as uh, absolutely as tested, it's, right? It's it, it's part of this mentality that I was trying to talk about in the beginning of my uh, lecture uh, uh, today. That we have a third generation of Israelis who police the Palestinians. Uh, it's not easy to police millions of people, and you need hundreds of thousands of people in order to do this. 
And they come from all walks of life in Israel. And they really think that what they're doing is sacred. And they really believe that there's nothing wrong in the inhumanity and barbarism that they exercise in their relationship with the population. And therefore, they think that they can export it as a moral uh, uh, product and not just as an efficient military one. Yeah, yeah. And hence, there are campaigns now that are targeting the collaboration between US police forces and- Absolutely, uh, yeah, rightly so. Uh, I want to um, get a little personal. Um, okay. um, and here you talk a little bit. I mean, you were born in Haifa. Uh, you served in the Israeli army. Uh, you went to Hebrew University. You taught at Haifa University for, what, two decades? Yes, at least. Um, were you, did you grow up in, critical of, uh, of Israel, or was there a process for you, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. really kind of questioning what Israel is? My, f uh, my parents are not responsible for my bad <laughs> behavior. I <laughs> here openly de absolve them from any responsibility. It's all my making. Uh, my family was not political and definitely was not anti-Zionist. Uh, no, it was my own journey uh, that began somewhere in the 1970s after the war of 1973, in which I participated as a soldier. And it continued with my great interest in history, uh, as in high school and in the university. And I was fascinated by the history in the place I lived in. And uh, somehow, uh, this journey into the past revealed for me, and I still don't understand why I didn't do the same for many other Israelis who became historians, revealed to me a history uh, of oppression, colonialis colonialism, and ethnic cleansing that no one told me about it. Nobody taught me about it. I think it also helped that I left Israel for my PhD studies to Oxford in England. And I chose on purpose an, an Arab supervisor, Albert Horani. Uh, and uh, I think it was very important to have him and the other supervisor, the late Roger Owen, as, as, as mentors to see things not only from the outside, but from a perspective of people who are not uh, uh, captivated and are not captives of the Israeli Zionist uh, uh, narrative. Uh, but all in all, I think it's a journey. There is no epiphany. There is no yeah. great uh, moment that this happens. Uh, every event in the present shows you that you should look again in the past, because it might have happened there. So if you think that the 1982 attack on Lebanon is not a war of, no, of cho is a war of choice, you ask yourself, was maybe 1967 a war of choice? Or maybe 48 was a war of choice? So I think this continued dialogue between the present and the past, for me, was, were the main material with, with which I built my worldview, if you want, uh, on the Palestine issue. I'm curious, you know, in, in my work at Palestine Legal, protecting activists from this uh, immense backlash that we're seeing right. uh, against uh, people who speak out for, for Palestinian rights, it's shocking to me that the arguments are the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that even though you have thoroughly debunked the myths, um, they are still alive and well, in a sense. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, Palestinians are still the aggressors. Uh, Jews are indigenous to Palestine and uh, are therefore not occupiers. Um, Zionism is a liberation struggle. Um, Palestine was a dump before they got there. Why, why are these myths so persistent in our political process, in our uh, in, in perpetuating the occupation and, and everything that's happening? Well, I ask myself the same question, <laughs> and I, my, my way of answering questions is usually by writing books. So I wrote a book about it, which is called The Idea of Israel, because I, 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 I was troubled by the same uh, 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 conundrum that you, you raise here. And my answer was that Israel actually invested, and before that, the Zionist movement, invested quite a lot 
in creating this fertile ground that you cannot easily debunk these fabrication just by presenting facts. Mm -hmm. uh, Edward Said was the first one who pointed to it in a, a 1983 article, Permission to Narrate, when he said, facts are not the things that would convince people to support the Palestinians. You need to have the compassion. You need to have a certain moral position which would allow you to see the facts in a different eye. And what I claim in my book, The Idea of Israel, is that the Israeli academia, and especially the Israeli cinema, uh, also through Hollywood, created a certain interpretation of the reality of which we talked about, you know, the, the Jews as the indigenous, the Palestinians as aliens, the Palestinians as aggressors and primitive, and all these fabrication. But they worked very hard to substantiate it twice. Once through academic work, namely to say scientifically you can show that the land was empty and that there is no Palestinian people and it belongs only to the Jewish people. They used the academia for this, which gladly collaborated in Israel with this and also here in the United States. And then they used the cinema as, and later the television as a kind of to work on the imagination, not just on the heart if you want, and not just about the cognition. Uh, you know, starting with the film Exodus, where the Israelis are portrayed like Aryans uh, of, Paul, uh, of the Paul Newman stock, and, uh, and the Palestinians are kind of a mixture between uh, uh, Godzilla and, and uh, 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 out, uh, extraterrestrial uh, creature from, from the space. And, and, but then it became even more sophisticated. Then you have a whole literature. So, it's, it's, it won't be that easy. I wish it would be that easy to come and say to people, here are the facts. You see, you were misled. These are fabrication. No. I think what you really have to do is to rehumanize the Palestinians. Because the most important method of any settler colonial movement is dehumanization. Because we have to remember, also in this country, settlers usually are victims of persecution. So they have to victimize someone else, and the only way they can do it is by dehumanizing them. And the only way of even making the settler think that what they did is wrong is not by facts, but by humanizing the Palestinians. And I think that's what I've tried to do in the 20 books I've written. It was not just exposing the facts. I was trying to say to people, a three-year-old Palestinian baby is not a terrorist. He cannot be a terrorist. It's impossible. Stop for a moment and think. Uh, an old lady, like the one I describe in the book from Han Yunis, the 61-year-old lady, cannot be a terrorist. She's a mother, and she reacts as a mother. Uh, but there is no compassion in the Israeli public and no compassion among the people in this country who support Israel, who do not see the Palestinians as normal human beings. I think in this in this moment that we're in, um, you know, with the with the rise of the resurgence of uh, white nationalism here um, and ethno nationalism and fascism, um, it's it really seems to have bolstered Israel's positions, and they they seem emboldened. Mm -hmm. by it, and certainly by the Trump administration that is uh, enabling some of the most extreme uh, positions um, in history, no? Um, I'm curious how you see that playing out in mm -hmm. Israel, um, and, and what's the relation to what's happening here, and, mm -hmm. and what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> yes. How do we get out of how this? How do we get out of this? <laughs> um, you know, I, I would like to say sort of three things about it. One is that as, my, as much as I detest uh, uh, the Trump's administration policy on Israel, I do not accept that it is worse than the policies towards Israel of the previous administrations. I, I think this man is more, tr for whatever reason, is more transparent than those who yeah. preceded him. Certainly. And he doesn't bring anything new into the American policy. It's the same policy. Unconditional support for the Israeli brutality, immunity from any international condemnation, 
and supplying Israel with all the money and the weapon it needs to continue the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. This has not changed. So that's the first point. The second point is that uh, what is interesting is, is the fact that uh, uh, what happens here from an Israeli perspective is something that already happened before in certain European countries, such as Hungary, uh, Poland, uh, and then later on in Brazil. Um, but interestingly enough, this is not enough, and maybe that's a point of optimism. It's not enough for most Israelis to be supported by people which are regarded by their own society as nationalist, fascist, or extreme. The Israeli self-perception was, and remember, the left was the main supporter of Israel, not the right wing. The self-perception of Israel was, we are regarded in America, for instance, both by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party as an asset to the United States, as the only democracy in the Middle East or the, jungle, the villa in the jungle. And, and I think what happens now is that suddenly the Israelis learn that you cannot use F-16 against the BDS. And it drives them mad because usually they know how to solve problem by bombing them. But you cannot bomb the BDS. I mean, they're using brutal, as you know, they're using brutal means, but they have a, a real issue here. And the fact that there is right-wing political elites that are collaborating with them is nothing new. The new thing is that the right wing is now collaborating with them. Previously, it was the left wing that collaborated with them. And the last point I would say is something that you, you hinted to, and I think is absolutely true, that we have to decide whether we are pessimistic or optimistic of this aberration that we see in the history of the, of the United States under the Trump era and in other places, including in Israel. And we should ask ourselves, and I think as historians we have a more positive point on view on this, and, and say that actually these bad periods will come to an end. We were there before. In fact, we were in far worse periods, even in this country, uh, in, in the modern history of the United States. And I think that if we will be able at least to use this kind of recognition and say that what happens in Israel and Palestine and what happens in the United States and what happens in Europe and what happens in Brazil is part of the same human story. Yeah. We would debunk the most important Israeli myth of all, the myth of exceptionalism. And I think this is something that we should sort of drive some courage from that. Mm -hmm. The fact that now, and especially what you mentioned about the Israeli kind of witnesses coming to the military courts or the courts in the United States, now, a struggle for the civil rights in America is the same struggle as the civil rights in Israel. This is something Israel has worked hard through APAC to prevent. The, the last thing they want is that someone would compare Martin Luther King to any Palestinian, or that would, one would compare the march of, uh, in the South for civil rights with the Palestinian march in Gaza. But they cannot control it. They cannot control it. Young people in particular see the parallels. Young people are using the term apartheid of South Africa in their activity for Palestine in American campuses. It drives the Israelis mad. The only question I'm asking myself is, why don't we see yet uh, consequences of this shift on the ground in Palestine? Why are the political elites so strong and so undemocratic mm -hmm. not to allow the impulse of so many people in this country and elsewhere in the world to end the Israeli oppression and colonization. Why isn't there any move on the ground? And my historical answer is it will come. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it will come. I, I talked with Mandela and I talked with Desmond Tutu and they told me that the last days of apartheid in South Africa were the worst. And they lost hope about a year before apartheid fell. Uh, I think we should not get into this mentality of despair just because uh, uh, we still have not succeeded in changing that reality. Uh, I think we have a very young generation of Palestinian now in academia, in culture, on the ground in Palestine that I think have a different idea of how to move forward the resistance. 
And I believe that these young people would be far more successful than we were uh, uh, because they are much more in tune with this world than we are. And I think we should give them all the support we can by continuing the BDS project and by making sure that any person with a modicum of decency is not afraid to say that Zionism is racism, that Israel is an apartheid state, and we should want to see it a pariah state unless it changes its politics. And and yet when when we say all those things, as you alluded to, we're anti-Semitic mm -hmm. and we are pro-terrorist. I mean, this is, uh, yeah. we, yeah. our cases, the cases that come to us, you know, the majority, the underlying argument is that criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism. Yeah. It's this complete conflation of Zionism and Judaism, um, and there's, you know, once, once you're smeared, <laughs> what's your answer? No, I'm not anti-Semitic, <laughs> I have Jewish friends. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, yes. uh, so it's and, it's, and it's a tactic that is being used across the board. I mean, um, uh, you know, here in the US, it's used against uh, students and academics, and, and obviously we know in the UK that uh, Jeremy Corbyn has, has uh, uh, faced, faced that. But it's also, you know, th there's a redefinition of anti-Semitism that says basically any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. And there, you know, here in this country, there, there's legislation that imposes this definition. Um, and, and the same is happening in the UK. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the academic and political uh, context in, in yeah. um, England right now? Yeah, maybe before that, if I can sort yeah. of comment on what you, what you said. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, it's very important to historicize these accusation that uh, criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism. I think it will help a lot uh, uh, to challenge and expose these allegations as empty and, 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 and baseless. Uh, Israel was not using, if you noticed, until 2005, 2006, the main Israeli propaganda was that if you criticize Israel, you support Islamic terrorism. They didn't use anti-Semitism very much. This strategy has failed. And now they're using the idea that you can stifle any criticism on Israel by alleging that it is anti-Semitism. Now, it's important to uh, uh, find the space. I'm not saying it's easy. But you can't do it in a soundbite. You cannot say to people, no, you are wrong, and by that end the, the debate. You, you have to say to them, do you have time? I'll explain to you exactly the history of Zionism, the history of Judaism, the history of critic, criticism of Zionism. And we should demand that space, even in court. Because the reason that these allegations are brought against Jeremy Corbyn in England or here against activists is because of the success of the activists in the civil society in the West to shift the support from Israel to the Palestinians. And this is the reaction. The reaction is to use legislation and to use these accusations. Now, it's very important to contextualize it and explain to people why it is done. I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm just saying that if you have the space, I think you can easily defeat this. And this is what we did in England. Uh, uh, Israel is terrified by the prospect of a leader of a, a major party in Britain becoming a prime minister with a known and, uh, and clear support for the Palestinian rights. They are terrified by it. And they are doing everything possible to target him by accusing him of anti-Semitism, which is not easy because he's not anti-Semitic at all. And uh, at first, it looked as if it works. At the beginning, we thought it was working. And then we strategized against it, exactly by the way I'm, I'm talking about. We, we asked people to give us the space and to deal with the historical context and not with the moment, not with the picture of Jeremy Corbyn in Tunis in 1993, but with the history of the PLO as a resistance movement. 
And slowly we found out that this is something the Israelis did not want to be involved in. They don't like debates of history yes. because history is on the side of the Palestinians in this story, not the Israelis. And, and, and therefore, it will be a struggle. It won't be an easy struggle, but I think you, I, I keep saying it to my legal friends, you need the historians, surprisingly, for this. Uh, you need us. You need the historical context. The whole rep report on Israel, the whole coverage of Israel in this country is totally dehistoricized. I'm not talking about taking it back 2,000 years ago. I'm talking about what happened in the last 200 years. And I think we need to rehistoricize it as much as to humanize it. Uh, I, I don't think it would be easy, but I think it is still uh, uh, possible. I would just tell you one anecdote, uh, which is also typical to the way we try to dialogue with the Israeli Jewish society. I go once a year to the March of Return inside Israel, where we march into one of the destroyed Palestinian villages. And where it always takes place when Israeli Jews celebrate their day of independence. And they celebrate the day of independence in parks, recreational parks built on the ruins of Palestinian villages. So we clash, the Israelis who celebrate the independence, and we, and the Palestinians and the Israelis who support them, who commemorate the village that was destroyed. And when we leave, we, we meet each other at the, at the crossroad. And the re people recognize me. And they open the window, and after kind of blessing uh, of, of the cursing kind, uh, they, they say to me, how can you do this? And I always answer, do you have time? It's a very good question. If you have time, an hour and a half, I will explain to you why I do that. And of course, unfortunately, most of them don't want an hour and a half. But those who do, are very confused after that. Mm. If we can get the space in America and elsewhere to fight these soundbites allegation with a profound analysis in a society and culture that is not easily uh, uh, agreeable to profound analyses <laughs> without, without uh, uh, um, kind of condemning anyone here, um, I think we should, we should strive to do this as much as we can. In a couple words, um, what gives me hope is the young people I see out there organizing across movements and, um, and speaking out despite the repression. And the Michelle Alexander op-ed in the New York Times the other day. Absolutely. And Rashida Tlaib in, in Congress. What, what gives you hope that we can come to a just First of all, uh, as an historian, I, I know that evil regimes and injustices do not stay forever. There is an end. There was an end to the Pinochet regime. There was an end to apartheid in South Africa. There was an end to uh, racism and apartheid, official one at least, in South, Southern United States. I think that the evil kind of brutality that I described in this lecture and in the book is something that more and more people are aware of. And I think people eventually will take a stance, including the Jewish communities around the world, especially the young Jews around the world. And, and, and one of the major things that gives me hope is even the young Christians in this country, even among fundamentalists who sent their kids to Israel with the, with the idea that they create another Christian Zionist kind of cadre, find it very difficult to explain to, this, to those kids what they kind of cognitive dissonance that they have of what they've been told and what they see on the ground. In this age in time, you cannot hide the reality anymore. It's there, it's transparent. And I'm a believer in humanity. I believe in humanity. And, and I think that uh, it would be very difficult to dismantle the kind of structure of fabrication I talked about that Israel has built. And it would be very difficult to decolonize Israel and Palestine. But the fact that it is difficult should not dissuade us. And what gives me also hope is that I think we wasted 50 years since 67 talking about the wrong solution, talking the wrong language about this story. And I think we're beginning to talk about the right solution now, and we are employing the right dictionary now. And we're just beginning. We're just beginning. And I don't think we should allow ourselves to be hope hopeless, without hope, uh, uh, just because we started a new road which we should have undertaken many, many years ago. But it's better late than never.
we could keep talking for an hour, but, um, but um, uh, thank you all for coming. It was really a pleasure, and thank you, Ilan. Thank you, thank thank you, you to the Lennon much. Foundation. Thank you, thank you, Lennon Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ilan Pate thank you. will be outside signing books, so please join us in the lobby. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.